Um, I liked your uh, your analogy about how the muse the music business has changed, and um, I'm by no means an expert, and call me a heretic or or whatever. But wasn't the newspaper business founded on the paywall? I mean, we had paywalls much before the internet, right? I mean, you had a it cost a nickel for you to buy that information. It seems to me like the newspaper business needs to come up with a new business model. And I mean, it's the same business model that we've been that we've been hooked on for a couple hundred years. You look at like television. Television uh, started out when it was live television. They incorporated commercials like right into the soap opera. Um, and now with the the advent of like you know DVRs and TiVo, they're doing that today. You know, they're going back to that model where the commercial is the, the entertainment model. I, I mean, don't you yep. think the news media, the, the newspaper business needs some other revenue stream other than the paywall? Because the paywall, it, you know, it's worked really well up until this point, but it's all sort of starting to fall apart. That barrier of entry for that information is, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the advertising on top of that was was gravy on top of that that paywall um and there needs to be a fundamental shift i i think in how that that information is delivered and 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 paid for yeah well hi historically um advertising has paid much more of the freight than circulation to to start with but i think all of us who who think about this at all believe that newspapers will need a constellation of things to sell you know Everything in people sort of sometimes um, scoff a little bit at the amount of money and time the New York Times is putting into their online store, um, but actually that online store does pretty good business, and you can imagine a future in which your membership of the New York Times gives you a 10% discount at the New York Times store. Now there's a business that you know the newspaper would not have thought about 20 years ago. But it's going to take a bunch of those, and that inventing those is, is really going to be the challenge. You know, your question reminds me of one other thing that I should say about tablets and tablet publishing. Um, that, the whole nature of tablet publishing and the idea of the localized app begins to really shift when you have constant, dependable internet connectivity. I mean, right now we're in those days of when we build an app for news, we go, well, I can only put so much video in, or the file's going to get to be too big. I think what we're going to see over this next decade is it becomes clearer and clearer that wherever you go, you have internet access and decent bandwidth, that the, the line between what is an app resident on your device and content that's out in the cloud begins to really fade. I also think that <clears throat> right now we're in this place that I call post-browser publishing, which, thank God, I was so sick of the browser. It just was hanging around my content all the time. Couldn't do anything about it. Apps are post-browser content. But I think in many ways, the browser itself is going away. In fact, sometimes I joke that you know there's going to be a trivia contest uh, in Silicon Valley 50 years from now where they ask trivia questions, and one of them is going to be, what was a browser? <laughs> and because the browser is going to go away. So I think when we are constantly connected to the cloud, the line between this is a website and this is an app is really going to start to, to fade. Plus, as I say, I have faith that we're moving towards much more generalized standards. You know, it's a fight over HTML5 now. It's been a fight over video formats. But the direction is clear. We're moving towards much more open standards. So I think that is where the cloud connectivity impacts specifically our ideas of how we publish on tablets. Maybe not this year, but in years to come. Yes? A quick question, and um, a good example was the photograph of, from New York City of the person who got pushed onto the tracks and the uproar. In 2020, obviously, everybody on that platform is going to be a source of that story, and mm -hmm. they videos will be, everybody in the world will see that. Uh, how, how are we going to have um, some control over the amount of contact content that's poured onto the cloud constantly every day like that? Is, is, is news going to go away because it's ubiquitous or, or what? Uh, news will be redefined. I mean, I, what it's going to become clear is that there will be so much 
third party sort of freelance content floating around that the ability of the editor to choose becomes really, really important. I think algorithmic choosing of content is going to, we're going to see more and more sort of smart filters. Um, uh, ultimately, it's going to be a filtering process, and, and what, what do you believe? Um, because it's, it's quite clear that, you know, as people see more and more spoofing on things like Twitter, they realize that Twitter is actually not necessarily your best source of news. We're so early on in this period of time that I think the public is still trying to figure out, you know, well, gosh, if somebody says they're in um, Mogadishu, I should certainly, you know, that's the person I should listen to. Um, well, you have no idea whether they're or not, or what they're doing there, or who they out work for. That is a kind of knowledge that the audience is, is still absorbing. Uh, but I do think that the, the role of the editor, the interpreter, you know, it will, will be forever. You cited uh, a number of industries that are adapting to the XML uh, right. standards already, travel and that source. From an organizational structure, and it's easy to say, well, media companies should just go out and hire more developers, but how do you see the organization, what are the important things that a, a media organization right now should be focusing on in terms of their, not just their organizational structure, but the things that they ought to be doing to help this move forward? Um, you know, I think it's <clears throat> one of the really basic ones is to add as much meta tagging and, and data to content as possible, even if it doesn't make sense at the moment. And there's usually a lot of pushback on that. Um, the New York Times, we um, moved because we were big believers in metadata for a lot of reasons. We actually ended up creating demos of what you could do with really uh, sophisticated tagging on stories that we then took into the newsroom <laughs> and showed them and said, you know, when we have great tagging, here's what we can do in terms of geolocating stories and creating new kinds of content sort of algorithmically. Um, to, to me, making sure that our archives and our ongoing production of content is, is appropriately tagged for this new environment. I think that's the least sexy part of the whole business, <laughs> but probably it's going to ultimately be really crucial. I have a question. You are a writer and you say that the uh, long reading is going to fade away, but I see that in Kindle store and in many bookstores, they say that now the American people, at least in Europe, they are reading more because of these uh, devices. So isn't that strange that we lose that? It's, um, there will always be long form readers. Uh, and the generation that buys books today grew up in a time when you really had to be a long-form reader to become well-informed. Um, I think that, that long-form reading is less, is less necessary. I think it's, <clears throat> let me back up and say that I think long-form reading is a difficult skill to learn. It's highly unnatural compared to all the other ways that we absorb information from the world. We naturally see things, we naturally hear things. Reading is completely unnatural. Um, that said, learning to do long-form reading and writing, I think, shapes cognitive processes in a way that's very, very valuable. And it's a loss when people are unable to do long-form reading. But they think, they, uh, you know, uh, but it's simply going to be the case that people can, without long-form reading, do a lot. A lot of the books that sell, uh, you will notice uh, self-help books tend to be chunked into smaller pieces these days. They're little bite-sized kinds of content. Um, when I started at Rolling Stone, we thought 5,000 words was your average magazine length article, right? And today in Rolling Stone, if it's over 2,000 words, it's considered to be a major piece. So we're seeing that shortening everywhere. Um, uh, again, it's not necessarily a good thing. I once wrote a science fiction story in which, in the distant future, we actually no longer looked for kids in school with reading disabilities. We looked for kids with reading abilities. And we chose them like we chose young athletes, and we trained them in long form reading. And everyone else, we said, you know, if you can read 100 words, that's fine. <laughs> yes. 
This is a follow up on his question. Uh, yeah. You know, I kind of agree with you that long-form reading, whether we like it or not, is declining from a user base. Yeah. How should the newspapers react to that? And how should they modify how they write, how the reporters do stuff, especially in the light of their news consumption also migrating more to an online world in addition to the printed paper? What kind of suggestions would you have? Well, you know, one thing I've argued about a lot in journalism schools is teaching short form writing um, and the ability to do something in 75 words that really packs a lot of information. Um, we had great interns at Newsweek.com, um, master's degrees, well educated, but I'd set them down to do a photo essay and I'd say, okay, these, you know, these captions have to have a lot of information and they can only be about maybe 50, 75 words long. They were clearing their throats by the time they got to the end of 75 words. I mean, it was interesting. It was a skill that they simply did not have. I mean, they were great at the 2,000-word story, 1,500-word story. So I think that's a new focus for us. Um, the other thing that, that I keep thinking about is the whole you know, pyramid style itself, you know, and to what extent that is a residue of print and the extent to which blogging and the blog structure, reverse chronology, actually makes more sense. I had this discussion with people at the Times who, for example, get sent to do the uh, launch story of um, a space shuttle, right? They're expected to do the story that appears on page one the next day, but on the website, they're continually updating the story but it's not being done in blog format. They're going through and changing the third paragraph or the second paragraph, and for readers can't really tell that they're doing that. Um, and at a lot of print newspapers, you get credit for the story that you're doing on page one, uh, not for the blog, and the blog, uh, not for the, the story that's online, but the nature of the story online being sort of semi-pyramid style turns out to be a real pain to, to update. So I think those two pieces right there is you know, how do we present information in more bite-sized chronologic chunks? And how do we teach people to write in a compact way? Those are both important to me. Yeah, uh, you mentioned something about uh, instead of an uh, article that is, say, 2,500 words, it would be better to have a slideshow. Is that really a direction that should be considered, especially I, on the online? I think. Um, well, we did, I, I've done some experiments in which um, in Boston we took a 2,500 word story about Rose Kennedy, which a very, you know, a significant figure in Boston, and we ran it as a 2,500 word piece, nicely arted, you know, with pictures and sidebars, et cetera, on um, the website. And then we also pulled out eight photographs from the book. It was based on a book with those little captions. And you know, the results from metering were pretty obvious. You know, people would read the first or second page of the, the long article. Some people went all the way through, but most got, you know, it, it's 50% off per click. That's the rule. Slideshows are click magnets. You know, people click on the first one, they go all the way through. So at the end, I mean, I tried to look at it and figure out who got the most information out of that story. And I think it was the people who, who saw the slideshow went all the way through it because we had most of the main points of the 2,500 word piece somewhere in those eight captions. Uh, video has not been a good play on newspaper sites. Um, yeah. uh, does this suggest that newspapers should keep slogging away at, specifically video, not uh, now, uh, or, or that uh, we've lost that play to other media? No, I think video is, is still a key piece. Um, the direction I think that we're going is that we're going to have publishing technology that lets us keep sort of all, all media at parity. We can use whatever media type we want at any moment in time. And there's times that video, or very short video, that's something that interests me these days, is, is you know, we're seeing more and more work on people doing five second videos, basically moving stills, um, rather than the sort of traditionally, it's you know, a two, two, sec, two minute stand up that's, you know, nobody watches more than the first 15 seconds. So I think video is still crucially important. It's just got to be done to the, you know, 
with the attention span in mind. 